A very good morning to all of you, and thank you, MIT University, for conferring this honor on me. Dr. Chauhan, Mrs. Chauhan, Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, members of the faculty, parents, and the proud students who are passing out today, and my friend Vijay Shekhar. I am indeed very delighted to be here in this campus. And I must apologize in some sense that I have been wanting to come to MIT for some years now. And it was meant to be in Noida, as uh, Dr. Chauhan mentioned. But here I am on this glorious day of in this beautiful campus. And therefore, in some sense, I have fulfilled my commitment to you. Days like these are always very special. I remember way back in 1976 when I was sitting amongst one of you, eagerly waiting for my degree to be conferred, and more importantly, get out and get into the real world. All of you are today going to rejoice your hard work. You have put in a lot of work in the last few years to get to this particular point. Your parents are proud parents today, eagerly awaiting for you to go out and make your mark in the world which I have no doubt you will, because we are living in very, very exciting times today. I have straddled three different generations of business environment. When I came in 1976 into business, like perhaps many of you, I had nothing in my pocket, but I had a dream, and a dream to do something. And I did not know what that something was, but there was a desire to do something, and something exceptional. And I have no doubt that, as Dr. Chauhan mentioned, many of you would be achieving your glorious heights in the next few decades. When I walked in 76 into business, there was very little space for young entrepreneurs. Most of the key hold positions were taken by big industries, big industrial houses, or largely by the public sector. Almost anything an entrepreneur could think of doing was controlled by the government. Where would you manufacture? What would you manufacture? How much would you manufacture? Was all determined by somebody sitting here in Delhi. You have seen the big difference that we are now seeing today. You can practically dream of anything. You can start what you want. You can start where you want. And more importantly, capital is available in plenty. I wish I had an hour to speak to you, and I would have loved to, but I am constrained by my time, and in fact, must apologize that I may not be here when most of you are going to get your degrees. I had promised uh, Asim that I'll come here for an hour, then because I have to go back. But let me, in a few minutes, share some of the sensations that I've gone through in my 40 years of uh, working life. Good entrepreneurs seek opportunities. They are not daunted by the hurdles that come across them. And we are not necessarily the brightest. And as uh, once Albert Einstein said, I'm not so smart. It's just that I stay with the problems longer. I have always stayed with whatever I did to a point where I ensured that I crossed the line. And the difficulty that I see in many of the entrepreneurs who don't make the cut and those who do is that the tenacity and the passion and the patience to go across the line is missing. You will face your hurdles. There will be lots of difficulties. And many a times you will say, why am I doing this? There is no hope. But you must be persistent and stay with the problems long enough. And I can tell you, you'll resolve them. The second thing is, look for opportunities into spaces which resolve problems of the society. Find places where you can make a difference. Way back in 1979, I had a small business uh, in which I was doing multiple things as usual, uh, small scale industry work that young entrepreneurs do. But in 79-80, I got my big break of importing portable generators from Suzuki Motor Company in Japan. I was fairly young, I was 22, 23 years old then. I became the single largest importer of generators in the world in about three years. I used to be in Tokyo for literally three years, in and out, and had my learning from the Japanese grandmasters, both in the manufacturing space, 
in the marketing space, in the branding space. And what I did learn in university or college, I picked up from those grand masters there. But in 82, the government decided to ban import of generators. Overnight, I had no business. I had a small office in Calcutta, an office in Chennai, an office in Bombay, and I used to operate out of Delhi. And I knew that I had to do something new. And that was the time I went back to Japan, did not find anything interesting which would resolve some problems in the country or will be a solution to create a niche for yourself. Went to Korea, did not find anything. Landed in Taiwan and in an electronic trade fair saw a push for the telephone. Until that time, India had about six, seven hundred thousand rotary phones. That was the entire telecom world of India. And I don't know how many of you students would have ever had the pleasure of dialing a rotary phone. Perhaps never. I brought India's first push button telephone in uh, the year 1983. And that is the time my romance with telecom started. I brought India's first cordless phone, first telephone answering machine, first fax machine. And in 1992, when the government decided to open up the mobile telephony to the private sector, or rather for the first time ever to introduce mobile phones in the country, as a rank outsider even then, with a very small balance sheet, I decided to participate in the big boys game. Many people thought we were being foolish. Telecom services was meant to be either in the state sector or to be done by very, very large business houses. In fact, even today, there are perhaps no other stories in the telecom services arena which has come out of the stable of a first generation entrepreneur. For me, there was a role model, Craig Macau, who built in the US's first coast-to-coast -coast mobile company. He eventually sold out. But he did something which was brilliant. He moved from region to region. And I realized that the telecom business is modular. And you don't have to do a 5 million ton steel plant or a 5 million ton refinery or a 5 million ton fertilizer plant. You could start with a very small footprint and then grow rapidly from the uh, revenues and earnings that you would generate from there. I could simply say, the rest is history. We launched in 1994 India's first mobile phone here in Delhi, and then continued to expand across the entire length and breadth of the country. Today, Airtel serves nearly 95% of India's population, and is at 350 million customers the third largest telecom company in the world today. When we got big and perhaps a bit lazy, people like Vijay Sharma came in. They did something that we could have done ourselves, but we couldn't. And that's the lesson I must share with you. Every now and then, the big boys will slip. They will miss a heartbeat. They will miss an opportunity. And in come people like Vijay. He started to provide online electronic payments, started in a very small way, into paying mobile phone top-ups. That's where he started his life. And today, as you know, Paytm has created a great brand, great image, and great size for themselves. So in every generation, there will be opportunity. My own son, Kevin, uh, he's a telecom engineer. He has started his own messenger service called Hype. Some of you may be using it. Uh, it's a difficult space. He's competing directly head-on with WhatsApp. He's got 100 million customers today. Over 1.3 billion messages go every day on his network. And the telecom company, all the telecom companies, including Airtel, could not create a messaging service. So all of you have great hope of becoming bigger, better than large companies that exist today. Hold that thought in your heart and go out and conquer the world. Good luck. Thank you.